Hey YouTube, let's talk about the line finder real quick since I'm working on it tonight and I thought maybe I'd just talk about it for a second. So, what does a line finder do? Just like the name says, its job is to find a line. It's the first thing that goes into action when you originate a call on the panel switch. Basically the architecture is, these banks back here uh, have all your subscriber lines. And these rods here will go up and hunt for your line with the objective of connecting you eventually to a sender that's going to give you dial tone and accept your dial digits and do all the cool switching stuff. But the first thing we need to do is get a line. And the way we do that is by taking the phone off the hook. Once I take the phone off the hook, you'll see one of these line finders go up and then stop when it reaches my line. Here we go. didn't work! Ah! Okay. I can fix it. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna pick up a phone and it's gonna find a line because it's gonna work this time. Alright, cool, that worked. Here's the line finder that it selected and I'm in bank Four, I believe, so zero, one, two, three, four, and I should see, yep, this little guy right here has closed and has hunted to find my line. Now I'm connected from my phone through the line finder, through this guy, up, out the top, over to the next frame, over there, and then into the sender, and my phone has dial tone. Now when I hang up that phone, this will go back down. Ah! Okay, so what are we doing on the line finder today? Well, just like everything on this switch, we only have a few of these selectors actually working and hooked up. Because it's a museum and everyone said, oh, well, we don't need the whole thing, but I'm Sarah and I say we do need the whole thing for a number of reasons. One of which is to distribute wear evenly. I don't just want a few of these to wear out. I want the whole thing to get used. Number two, it's an awesome machine. And the whole thing, you should be able to use the whole thing. You know, it's cool. So I want to bring up more line finders. And to do that, you need to do a ton of wiring. And it looks kind of like this. All right, here we go. Bring it up new line finders in the panel. Um, bit of a process, and I'll tell you why in a little while. So, first thing we gotta do is get the original wiring, because someone already made this list from the correct drawings, and the wire colors are wrong, but the from and to are correct. So this is the district side, this is the line finder side. So we'll go over to the district frame and look up there. There's a bunch of wires going to the line finder. And then you gotta hook those up, bring them up over. See my ladder seat way the heck up there. Hook those up according to the drawing. I'm not smart, so I made a color-coded drawing for myself, or like a little list that says like, oh, this is what color goes to what terminal. So I did that. That's all hooked up. And the sender selectors also need to be hooked up in order for this to work, because after all, the line finder, district, and the sender selectors, which are down here, which are down here, these bad boys right here, all have to be hooked up together in order to work fully. But, regardless of not having the sender selectors hooked up, I should have enough to at least make it jiggle and do a little dance. It won't be the right dance, it won't be the right dance, but it will be a dance. And, <clears throat> but seeing as how this line finder has not worked since 1974, um, like, what, 45 years, jeez. Okay, so 45 years. 
we gotta clean it first. And the way we do that is with the line finder cleaning tool that I keep in my toolbox. No one gets to take this. It's actually not the line finder cleaning tool, it's just a uh, bank cleaning tool, generic bank cleaning tool. And I have to get a new piece of sandpaper on it because this one is all gross. So I'll go into my secret sandpaper drawer where I keep my strip of sandpaper that nobody else can use because rawr, it's mommy, rawr. I'll rip off a new piece. You gotta have the right length. Uh, I just use the old junk piece to size up the new piece because uh, it's easier that way. Now we take the tool. Oh, it's dark in here. Uh, let's go this way. We gotta fold this in half so the sandpaper is on the inside. Is this the right size? Did I make it too small? No, it's good. Fold it in half so the sandpaper is on the inside of the fold. And then slide the open end of the fold into this little groove here. So now we got a folded in half piece of sandpaper in this groove and then holding the end we have to bring it around and get it over the the mouth or the face of the tool. As I folded the loop around and now I'm going to pull it here like that. Now we have a tool with some fresh sandpaper on it. Let me throw away our old junk one. Now this is a job I don't let anybody else do because it's very delicate and if you apply too much pressure you can break the little uh, terminals, little tangs that, are, that you're trying to clean. Let's get the ladder over here. Now, the line finder we're trying to clean is this one, and we're using banks 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, so those are the ones I'm going to focus on right now. And I'm going to bring the light down so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Alright, let's do this bank because that's the one you're looking at. We've got three rows of contacts here. Tip on the left, ring on the far right, and the middle is split up between sleeve and hunt. We need to clean all of these contacts on the five banks that we're actually using, zero through four. And then we're gonna have to clean the actual brushes as well, which I'll do with a Q-tip. So to clean them, the left side is pretty easy. Just insert the tool in straight, push a little pressure, uh, a little rightward pressure, and then just go down like that. Now these are obviously more gross than they ordinarily would be, because again, they haven't been used in 45 years. So I'm just going to do this a few times. And then I'll go to the next row. In this row you have to be careful, because the terminals are really close together. And if you pull down too hard, We'll break them. They're delicate. So go slow. Keep your tool aligned as straight as possible. Take it easy. Great. That is bank 012. I'll do bank 1. And I'll be back when I'm done. All right, that's done, and what we're looking for is a shiny surface <clears throat> on the terminals. So you see this bank, I'm gonna zoom in, try not to cover the light. See how the terminals are a nice, pretty, brassy color? That is after I did the work. And if I go to the next one, which I haven't touched yet, See how the terminals are dull? That's how you can tell when one's been done versus when one hasn't been done. Next thing we have to do 
and I don't know that we have to do this, but I'm just going to be proactive about it. We have to clean the brush contacts themselves because they're probably also kind of tarnished and oxidized. So do the same thing. Um, grab a Q-tip and some mineral spirits and get in there and clean off the contacts, each of these one, two, three, and four. On banks zero, one, two, three, and four, which are the banks we're using. While I go get that Q-tip, the other thing I had to do is the line finder has a chain circuit. And the chain circuit means that if you're not using all of the line finders, you have to override the built-in internal chain circuit. And the way they did this was they ran a lead from this lead from here down to the start. So there's the start of the chain. And the end of the chain was this one right here. I just use an alligator clip to temporarily move it up to the next one. Um, see, these line finders were never meant to be bypassed in this way. You would always be using the entire frame. So they built this chain circuit that starts there and goes through the contacts of all the Make Busy relays, or all the MB relays, all the way down. And since we're not you know, since when we got here, we weren't using the whole line finder. They just bypassed it. We actually, it's its even screwier than that. Um, and I'm really not going to go into the details right now. Or maybe I should. Who knows? Um, let me, you know what? Let me go into the details because it'll be... At least it'll be on video so someone else can watch this and figure out what the fuck is going on with this line finder. All right. Line finder. This line finder is called the 300 point line finder because it has 300 sets of terminals on it. Uh, 15, I'm sorry, 20 terminals in each bank and there are 15 banks, numbered 0 through 14. 15 times 20 is 300, hence the name 300 point. This particular line finder is one of the oldest line finders ever to exist. This is like line finder version 1. In fact, Seattle, um, Melrose Parkway, sorry, Rainier, Melrose, and West was uh, were the first panel offices to be installed just with line finders, not as an addition to an existing line switch office. Line switches were the technology that existed before line finders. So this is one of the first line finders that was installed in production in a new office. So, back to my thing. This is a 300 point line finder because it has 20 terminals in each bank. 15 banks means it's 300 points. This line finder uh, is differentiated from the newer 400 point line finder, which was an improvement on this design. This design had several drawbacks. One of them being that because there were 15 uh, banks, there had to be 15 brushes on these rods, and these rods were very heavy, so they had to have compensators at the top of the frame, basically springs on pulleys. See them up there? And they take up some of the weight of the very heavy brush rods so that the motor uh, and the cork rollers at the bottom of the frame can drive up the rods without slipping. So the later 400 point line finders were not quite so heavy. Alright, 300 point line finder. This line finder has two line groups. There's line group 5, which is over there. It is facing that way, away from us. And then we have line group 6, which is right here and facing towards us. These line groups contain 
the line and cutoff relays for each subscriber line. Let me actually take out the other one. I just wanted to put this. This one was upside down. I just wanted to fix it. Ah, there we go. Line relay, cutoff relay, line relay, cutoff, line cutoff, line cutoff, line cutoff, and so on. There are, in each bank, there are 20 pairs of line and cutoff relays. 10 on the bottom, 10 on the top. These are the line and cutoff relays for bank 4. Bank 5 is above. Bank 3, 2, 1, and 0 are below. This is line group 6. Line group 5 is identical. Why are there two line groups? Well, line group 6 has 300 sets from bottom to top, 300 sets of line and cutoff relays. Okay, that makes sense. 300 point line finder. Sure. Line group 5 over there on the other side has also 300 sets of line and cutoff relays. But Sarah, you ask, 300 plus 300 is 600. You're right. Here's the kicker. This line finder terminal bank assembly is split right here in the middle. There's a physical split going right down from the top to the bottom. It's been sawed in half. Now, you cannot see the split. If you just look at it casually, it looks like one thing going from here to here. It is not one thing. The 300 subscribers in group five get the line finder selectors from here to the left. The 300 subscribers in group six get the line finder selectors from here to the right. The line finder selectors in group 5 cannot reach the subscribers in group 6 because the terminal fabric of the line finder is physically split here. This side and this side are completely disconnected. So, in effect, what we have here in the museum is two line finder frames sandwiched into one assembly. We have, this whole thing is called line finder frame three, so we have one physical frame. But there are two logical halves to the topology. We have the group five half there, and the group six half there, and they operate completely independently of one another. They do not cross, they never touch. The reason they did this is because this line finder was originally built for low calling volume subscribers. This was a residential office, it was not a very big neighborhood, and there was not an extremely high calling volume at the time this office was built. If this office were, say, in downtown Manhattan, in the business district, this line finder would not have group 5 of 300 subscribers and group 6 of 300. It would just have one group of 300 and that group would have access to a full bank of selectors, meaning that there would be more selectors available for more people to be off of. But that is not the case with this line finder. This is a low traffic line finder and that's why they split it down the middle. They get this half, they get this half. Now, in addition to that split, there are more splits, logically split even further. Each half, left and right, is split in, in itself. You can see there's a gap right here and another gap right here. The reason for that is that if the multiple here goes from line 80 to line 99 in this segment, in this middle segment of group 5, remember we don't care about the higher group right now, in this middle segment of group 5, the multiple is flipped over. So this side is 80 to 99 on this bank. This half of 
this side is 99 to 80. The multiple is flipped. And you can see that. If you look right here, this is the wiring to flip the multiple. And the banks are even labeled. So you can see 80 there, 99 there, and then 99 there, and 80 there. Why did they do that? Well, they were very concerned about the time it took for a line finder to hunt and find your line. So when you went off hook, one of these line finders went up and then found your line and then got you to a sender which would give you dial tone. But, because they were so concerned that people would start dialing before they got dial tone, they didn't want any line finder to ever have to hunt very far. That is why there are 15 banks of 20, uh, of 20 terminals high, because the farthest this will ever have to hunt is 20 terminals. But wait, we can do better. If you are in the range of 80 to 90, or 80 to 89, the line finder will prefer to use this set of selectors, or finders, because this set will find you in the first half of its travel. And if your line exists in the group from uh, 90 to 99, this bank of selectors will try to look for you first because this bank is run 99 to 80. So this will find you in the first half of its travel in making it even more likely that you'll get a sender very fast. If all of the selectors in your bank are busy, or in your preferred half are busy, it will fall back to a selector in your non-preferred half. It's freaking crazy, it's wild, it's so cool. So, to recap, group five gets this half of the frame. It is physically split right here, there is no connection from left to right. Group six gets the right half of the frame. In each group, it is split halfway through. This side, terminals are numbered 0 through 20, sorry, 0 through 19, 20 through 39, 40 through 59, 60 through 79, 80 through 99, etc. And in this side, they're labeled 19 through 0, 39, 20, 59 to 40, 79 to 60, 99 to 80, and so on. That is so each, you know, your preferred half will get you, will get to your line faster. Whoa, nuts! Now the line finder has a chain circuit. And it uses these selectors, rotary selectors down here, to increment over its chain circuit. When I try to seize a line, this rotary selector should go. It incremented one. Incremented one more. It incremented one more. It will eventually reach the part that has been bypassed, and it'll just skip through it, I think. There, you just skip through the bypass bit. Skip through another bit. So what are those rotary selectors actually doing? Why are they rotating and what effect does that have on the line finder? Well, the line finder wants to do two things. Number one is it wants to distribute the load over each selector evenly. If it always started choosing a selector 
at the same point, the selectors in front, at the front of the line, would be picked more often than the selectors at the end of the line for a given subscriber group. So group five has this half of the frame. These selectors would always get picked first. These selectors would get picked rarely. That sucks. So the way they get around it is they have each selector wired in to one of those rotary switches that increments every time someone picks up. And as that rotary switch increments, it starts to choose an idle selector from the next one in line. So let's say the rotary switch is at one. It'll start looking for an idle selector here, the first one. If it finds this one idle, it will pick this one and it will go up and look for the line. If it finds this one busy, as in it's already on a call, it will go through this one and look at the next one. So it'll go all the way through this circuit, it'll say, ah, oh, it's busy because it goes through the front contact of the busy indicating relay, and then it will look at this one. If this one is free, it will start the call here. Next subscriber picks up, these two are busy, it will start the hunt here, but if this one's busy, and you get the point, it'll keep hunting across. Now in reality, because of the way subscriber traffic works, any one of these or any grouping of these could be busy at any time. It's not always going to be in a line. You could have this one, this one, this one, and this one busy, and then the rest could be free. Doesn't matter. It will always start hunting from the next selector and go up around the chain until it finds the first free one. If it reaches the end of the chain, at the, at the last selector, it loops back around to the first one and it'll start hunting here. And that way, it hunts through the entire range every single time someone picks up a line, thereby ensuring that a different selector gets picked every time. But wait, there's even more, because this frame is awesome! It's so crazy that they thought of this. Okay, now, what if there are 20 subscribers here, 20 here, 20 here, and so on, for a total of 300 on this side and 300 on that side? But we'll ignore the 600 just for this explanation. We'll just focus on this side. What happens if a subscriber in this bank picks up their phone and a subscriber in this bank picks up their phone? Because of the way the brush tripping mechanism works, by the way, this is the trip rod, and this is the thing that actually trips the brush once it goes up to start one of these brushes hunting. Once a selector starts going up, only one trip rod in any level can be activated at once, because if this trip rod were activated, one of these would get tripped. And if this trip rod were activated at the same time, one of these would be tripped. Then you'd have two selectors perhaps tripped on the same rod, and that would be no good because you'd have a double connection. So the rule is, for any time a selector is traveling upwards, only one trip rod can possibly be activated during that time. This has an unfortunate implication and it is that if we always start tripping at the zero bank, if we always give that bank preference, then subscribers in the lower banks will get a line finder first. They'll have first choice. So if someone picks up here and someone picks up down there, guess who's getting a line finder first? They are because their trip circuit has permanent preference in this group of possible banks that could potentially trip. That would suck, because the people in group zero would always get a line finder, the people in group 14 would have to wait for all the other ones to have gone through. They got around that too. What they did is the same kind of preference chain they did with these, they did with the banks as well. So each time someone picks up their phone, it starts looking for that subscriber at the next bank up. So if someone picks up in bank five, 
and someone picks up in bank six, and it's starting to look in bank four, who will get it first? Bank five. Then bank six will, once five is done finding. It'll go and then it'll be bank six's turn. Next time someone picks up their phone, it'll start searching in bank five. So bank five will go, then bank six will go. Next time someone picks up their phone, it'll start searching in bank six. Now, because it started the hunt in bank six, bank six will go, it'll loop all the way around through everybody else, and then five will get to go. This is how they make it fair for every subscriber, no matter what bank you're on. If all of this is done just in this circuit, just with wires and simple relays and rotary switches that hunt around in a, a, a bank of contacts to say, okay, we're going to move the preference one selector forward every time, and then we're also going to move the preference one bank up every time so that all selectors will have an equal chance of getting used and subscribers in each bank will have an equal chance of getting first pick of the trip circuit. Because remember, <clears throat> each bank has a trip circuit and only one bank can have its trip circuit active at a time because if two trip circuits were active at a time and a selector started hunting upwards, it would get tripped in two banks and you'd have a double connection. And that wouldn't be cool. Now on our line finder, there's actually two trip circuits per bank because if you remember, there are 300 subscribers here and 300 subscribers here, which means there's a trip circuit for this side and a separate trip circuit for this side and they're totally independent because the two halves never mingle. They don't talk. Wow, super line finder overview. I wish someone told me that when I started here because like, it's so cool, it's so cool. Okay, um, now that we've talked about that, and now that I've talked about moving that wire to, you know, to open up the, uh, the preference chain because they, they bypassed it when they brought it to the museum. They were just like, no, we're not gonna have the whole preference chain, we're just gonna have this little chunk of it. So I moved the wire up one, which basically unlocked this particular line finder. And now the preference chain is excluding this group on the very end, but these will be hooked up as well. I will just have to move the preference chain up to include these. So now I have this one, I've cleaned the banks, I have to clean the contacts, I don't know, or the, the brushes themselves. I don't know if I'll get to that tonight because it's getting kind of late. And then I've got a lot more work to do. So I will get to that. I will try to tape it. And I'll see y'all tomorrow. <laughs>